the USA, but the sign on the CEO's door often says, Made in India. Alphabet's Sundar Pichai, Microsoft's Satya Nadella, IBM's Arvind Krishna, Micron Technologies. Add in the chief executives of Adobe, Deloitte, Snap, VMware. And that doesn't count Indians running companies all over the world. Why have so many Indians risen to the top? The Node Coastal points to India's incredibly competitive education system. If you can survive the pressure it takes to get into one of the Indian institutes of technology, it gives you confidence to handle American universities and later the business world. Meanwhile, the belief in India's ability to produce so many tech wizards is reinforced every year. Indians make up about three-fourths of the immigrants receiving coveted H-1B visas for the U.S., and it's a safe bet that some of them will eventually find their way to the C-suite. Everybody's talking about the metaverse as something that's going to happen in the future, but there's an argument to be made that Roblox has already built a metaverse. What do you think? I think we started, and um, it goes back to how exciting it is to, to have a company in this space that I think has ultimately got so many years of growth to it and is a new category following other types of technologies. There's still so much innovation to be done, and there's so much invention to be done in this category that's mind-boggling. The critics think that metaverse, the term, is just marketing. How do you respond to that? This type of technology is much more difficult than the net or the web, which was another huge thing that we saw predicted and has started to come. But, but I think we're seeing early signs of it. When Mark Zuckerberg announced his plan to own the metaverse and change Facebook's name to Meta as if it was something new. Did that kind of bother you? Um, no, of course not. <laughs> it's really hard to predict in five to 10 or 20 years, what are the companies that really figure it out? And there's so many elements of innovation that are needed. Um, having a UGC community, one of our strengths, we think that's like a huge starting point for us, but we're early in our quest for innovation here. Roblox has built a huge business selling Robux. Does this evolve into a much bigger marketplace? It was this revelation that people would ultimately make a living on platforms like this that started this digital currency. It's very Roblox-centric in that we're a systems company or a utility, so it has formed this robust economy. It's allowed us to keep Roblox, you know, Roblox is free for the vast majority. Would Roblox ever partner with some of these other companies working on the metaverse, whether it is Meta or Unity or Epic or Microsoft? The core technology of, you know, how are we going to ultimately support 50,000 people in real time on a phone, going to a concert together and waving at your friends, I think that's going to be a lot of engineering work mm -hmm. that each company is going to be working on and it's going to be really hard. As far as ultimately, can an avatar go from one place to another? I think there'll be lightweight ways of starting to think about that. So what role do you think Apple and Android should play in the metaverse? And, and would their policies need to change to really support this vision? The biggest thing we would take advantage of if it were to happen is a change in those store fees. Mm. We we stay out of it. We let Google and Apple kind of run their businesses. But when we think about more and more developers making a living on platforms like us and having to build stuff, if those store fees were to change, we would move most of that money back to our developers. Your goal is to build an entirely new category of human co-experience, the next phase of human interaction. Yeah. How do you moderate that on such a massive scale? Yeah, and are you doing a good enough job? In the third week when we were live, you can go imagine Eric and myself back in our small office. Eric and I said, oh my gosh, safety and civility is what we're going to have to do. We had maybe 100 people at the time chatting on Roblox. We saw a few, not that egregious, but early signs, and we just made the call. This is going to be the foundation of what we do. In the early years of Roblox, as we've gotten bigger, we've gotten to the point where there's thousands of moderators. Every image that goes on our platform gets human reviewed. We filter text very stringently, especially for 13 and under players. We use a lot of AI and ML to help do this. Uh, we're always getting better. Um, but it is a key thing for us. How optimistic are you about AI and tech being able to do that? I'm really actually optimistic. We would never compare to the real world because our standards are so much more stringent. But I do believe this will just keep getting better and better. And I think over time it'll get to the point where if a six-year-old is on our platform, it's literally as if the parents wanted to be there with them watching everything. We'll be able to offer that type of thing. Now, a lot of parents are terrified. They're terrified of a future metaverse. They don't understand the parental control. Do you understand that feeling? We do. We actually have to. I think it creates a higher standard for us because I think we can't assume every parent is going to get that involved with their kids. There have been some serious content challenges, you know, stories about Roblox being a playground for virtual fascists. Yeah, this is not Roblox. Well, there was just a story about Kim Kardashian's own child seeing an ad for a game that claimed to have a yeah. sex tape of her. Yeah. What happened there? That was very unfortunate. There was a text blurb up very shortly that very, very few people saw. We took the place down. We moderated that user and they're off our platform. It was not, the video was never on our platform. There was no imagery on our platform. It was a very short mention, uh -huh. but very unfortunate. And um, well, you know, our vision is to be the most civil place for everyone. I asked Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Alphabet and Google, this question about kids and tech habits and screen time. And he said it's something that even stresses him out. You know, this is the guy who runs one of the most powerful technology companies in the world. Um, I have four kids, you have four kids. Did it stress you out? Like, how did you totally. deal with your kids? I think it highlights how much um, it's a responsibility of both platforms like us as well as parents. You know, we're all trying to figure this out. I think the one thing that we're very encouraged is, is that the time
Mal, you know, this is the guy who runs one of the most powerful technology companies in the world. Um, I have four kids, you have four kids. Did it stress you out? Like, how did you totally. deal with your kids? I think it highlights how much um, it's a responsibility of both platforms like us, as well as mm -hmm. parents. You know, we're all trying to figure this out. I think the one thing that we're very encouraged is that the time spent on Roblox tends to be more like hanging out together or being on the phone together or doing stuff together. And a lot less of it is isolated, either consuming content by myself or grinding away at something by myself. So we do like the fact that most of this is either social or involved in creation. What about entertainment? Would Roblox ever make a Netflix show? Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Mercedes-Benz is on a path towards CO2 neutral uh, mobility, so we have clicked the switch there, and really, uh, we're going to step-by-step step electrify everything. And what does that mean? Combustion engines get electrified. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars, only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. You've been investing in high fidelity graphics. What is the end game here for you know more human, more realistic avatars? I'll look way out like a science fiction writer and talk about it. And I'm, what I'm talking about now is super difficult. The end game, sometimes we talk about, we would go together to a rock concert or whatever concert you like. Um, we would be there with 50,000 other people. It would feel like a movie. It would feel like real life. So are you pushing towards something like Meta Horizon Worlds? Is, does that sound, you know, more experiences like that for adults? We sometimes think of Roblox ultimately as fading into the background as a utility like the electric grid, um, even though it's photorealistic and there's all these awesome avatars and connection and identity around the world. The things we start seeing built on this are a wide range of things. So you imagine this not just for kids, but for everyone, adults That's too? Right. Okay. Absolutely. What about entertainment? Would Roblox ever make a Netflix show? We would love it if one of our developers made a Netflix show. So mm. we, would, we would feel much more authentic if one of the creators on Roblox who's coming up with avatars and stories and ideas and characters, like that we want them to be in the limelight. Roblox shares took a dive on the back of Netflix results, which obviously plummeted. Are investors reading too much into the connection there? I think our company is somewhat unique. And what is very exciting to go to work and be the CEO is being in a market like this, you know, where we think ultimately billions of people are going to use this type of technology. And the other exciting thing about this market, there are so many big inventions that still have to happen. Mm -hmm. It feels like we're pretty mature, but inside our company, we realize like there's six or seven big inventions we need to make to get to that next step. Would Roblox ever consider more in-game advertising? Yeah, there's a funny trivia um, note I would share to all the Roblox fans out there. There was a time, the very first way we monetized was advertising. And then there was also a time when we had pre-roll video on Roblox, um, that's all gone now. And it's gone for a couple of reasons. We didn't want it to interfere with the user experience. And also our, our virtual economy has become such a powerful way to power this that we were able to take that down. In when increasingly economists are forecasting a recession and sticking with the energy theme, we're gonna be speaking to the new Secretary General of OPEC, of course, to get a sense of where we stand in terms of supply, demand, and pricing for oil. Big week here in the US, really on the earnings front. We're gonna get a big update with Home Depot and Lowe's, of course. Housing, as you know, has been a really big bright spot here during COVID in the US with some of the economic data that we're gonna get around that as well. Does that continue or are we really starting to see a significant slowdown in the face of rising rates? I wanna stick with retail and some of the earnings as well next week. We talked a lot about the consumer. Walmart, Target, TJ Maxx, Kohl's, all set to report next week as well. And we've talked a lot on our programs about sort of how inflation has hit the lower end consumer much harder than some of the luxury and retailers. So that will be a key focus for us here as well. Back to you, David. Thanks to Juliet Sally, Tom McKenzie, and Taylor Riggs. Coming up, we ask our special contributor, Larry Summers, whether those CPI numbers have him feeling any better about inflation. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
Companies now, they're getting hundreds, maybe even thousands of applications. So software has come in to automate the process. You want to write your resume for robots, not for humans. The only job your resume has is to be comprehensible to the software that is reading it, because that software or robot is going to decide whether or not a human ever gets their eyes on it. These things are programmed by a certain segment of the population that might not be totally inclusive or not be fully aware. Concerns about how this technology could exacerbate discrimination. For the FTC, I think foremost, the FTC needs to be making sure that we're fully understanding this technology. We don't trust companies to self-regulate when it comes to pollution. We don't trust them to self-regulate when it comes to workplace comp. Why on earth would we trust them to self-regulate AI? BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. To take us through the high points of this week, we welcome back our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, thank you so much for joining us from Aspen, actually, this week. We'll talk a little later about what you're doing out there. But first, we got CPI numbers this week. On Wednesday, they came in significantly better than a lot of people thought they would. So, uh, do you find some relief from this? Are we over the worst of it when it comes to inflation? I think these were encouraging numbers. We, we knew that the headline number was going to be coming substantially down because we could see what had happened with gasoline prices. The core number was better than most people uh, expected. Uh, that's certainly better than the alternative uh, to that. On the other hand, it was heavily driven by volatile sectors like used cars, like hotels, like airfares. We've sort of seen this movie before. We had a terrific core number in March, but it was from those volatile sectors, and then it bounced back up in April, May, and June. So we'll have to see uh, what happens going forward, but this is certainly a better number than most people uh, expected, and it will come.
come as a bit of relief uh, to the Fed. But I certainly think it's nothing like we are out of the woods. It's nothing like a fundamental change in uh, the orientation. It's nothing that means that we can pivot away from the overwhelming paradigm being a need for restrictive policy to contain inflation. Well, that's what I want to ask you about. Some relief for the Fed, you said. Is there a risk in that? You've warned me before about backing off too quickly in the cooling of the economy. Is there a risk the Fed pays too much attention to numbers like these? We'll have to, we'll have to see what they do. Uh, if the Fed regards this as a major game changer, they will be making another major mistake. I would be surprised if they regarded it that way, because I think when you look within it, you'll see that seasonally adjusted airfares coming out of two Julys when airfares were highly distorted by COVID. How could you take that seriously as a huge harbinger of new uh, trends? So I don't think they will make uh, that kind of mistake. They certainly shouldn't make that kind of mistake. But, you know, you get out of woods uh, and even deep woods, you get out of them one step at a time. So I don't want to deny that this is that there's some encouragement uh, in this number, but overreacting uh, to that would be a grave mistake. I think on your show before, David, I've talked about uh, how prudent people finish their regimen of antibiotics even as they're gratified four days in that they feel better. Larry, and I still think that's the right metaphor for thinking about uh, this situation. Larry, you and I have talked a lot about rates. What about the balance sheet? Because I'm going to say just about every week after we get done on this program, somebody emails me and says, what about the balance sheet? How effective is the balance sheet in helping to slow down the economy and get our arms around inflation? And are they doing it the right way? Should they be coming off the balance sheet even faster than they are? I wonder if they should come off uh, faster uh, than they are. I think the clearest statement about the balance sheet is that they should have stopped buying six or nine months earlier than they did. I think it's clear that we had something that history will look back on as a bit of a housing bubble. And I think they contributed to that by buying mortgage-backed securities. Now, I certainly think they're going in the right direction with QT rather than uh, QE. Could they do it faster? Perhaps they could. Would it make a major difference? I'm not sure that it would. Would it add to financial risk? It might in terms of some kind of accident in markets. Uh, in general, David, I think that yields are driven more by the fundamentals of what's happening in the economy and less by central bank policies like uh, QT and QE that I think many in the markets think, you know, I could be right about that or I could be, uh, or I could be wrong. But I think people often ascribe so the direct impact of these policies, what is in fact a signaling with respect to future monetary policies. And I don't think that now the, this is an area of stability. The Fed has set an expectation. That expectation is underway. I wouldn't be recommending a major change in balance sheet policies at, uh, at this point. Larry, when we spoke last week, the Inflation Reduction Act was getting toward being statute. Now we actually have pen put to paper. One of the issues that has been of concern to you is carried interest. You were concerned, actually, they should go further in cutting back in carried interest. In the end, they went even less far. What do you make of what happened there, particularly with some of the lobbying we saw on Capitol Hill? I think it's very sad how much uh, special interest lobbyists were able to stop things that are clearly in uh, the public interest. The idea that carried interest, which, after all, is income, paid to people who work at providing a service. Some people provide the service of legal work. Some people provide uh, the service of serving meals. Some people provide the service of asset management. And the idea that the people who provide the service of asset management, who are often some of the best paid people in our country, should be able to have their compensation be taxed at half the rate of everybody else, I think is outrageous. And I think it's very sad that people on the progressive side allowed themselves to be persuaded by very substantial donors to their campaigns that the legislation as it was originally drafted should be gutted uh, in that area. I also think it's very unfortunate, even more unfortunate, because it's in some ways a, a larger uh, issue, that the hugely historically important legislation or in agreement that Secretary Yellen reached with President Biden very much involved to foster international tax cooperation, that's probably going to collapse now, or may well collapse, because Congress wouldn't pass the enabling legislation by going after tax havens. And I sure wish that that had happened. I hope that the, right. some way will be found uh, to go back to that set of issues. And frankly, David, it all has me uh, thinking about uh, the role of money and business interests in our system. As you know, I am hardly one who takes the perspective of uh, the most uh, progressive wing of the Democratic Party, most left wing of the Democratic Party that wants to see things socialized or wants to see punitive uh, taxes uh, levied. I tend to be on the more moderate uh, side. But I am pretty offended by what's happened here. And I think uh, business leaders who 
lobbied these provisions right. who want to ex be explaining about public-private cooperation in the national and global interest and all of that, I think they should always be asked, uh, shouldn't they start by not lobbying to subvert the tax system we have? Okay, Larry Summers, I'm delighted to say you'll be staying with us because we're going to be joined by Melissa Carney. She's a professor of economics at Maryland, and she has convened Larry and some other esteemed economists in Aspen to address the very important question of after we come through whatever downturn we're going through, where will the growth come from? That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. on the product may read made in the USA, but the sign on the CEO's door often says made in India. Alphabet's Sundar Pichai, Microsoft's Satya Nadella, IBM's Arvind Krishna, Micron Technologies' Sanjay Mehotra, and that's just the start. Add in the chief executives of Adobe, Deloitte, Gap, VMware, and that doesn't count Indians running companies all over the world. Why have so many Indians risen to the top? But no coastal points to India's incredibly competitive education system. If you can survive the pressure it takes to get into one of the Indian institutes of technology, it gives you confidence to handle American universities and later the business world. Meanwhile, the belief in India's ability to produce so many tech wizards is reinforced every year. Indians make up about three-fourths of the immigrants receiving coveted H-1B visas for the U.S., and it's a safe bet that some of them will eventually find their way to the C-suite. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Our special contributor, Larry Summers, has stayed with us, and we are joined now by Melissa Carney. She's professor of economics at the University of Maryland, also director of the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, which she has convened in Aspen this week with Larry and other esteemed economists to address a critical question, really, of whether the United States could be facing stagflation. So, Melissa, welcome to Wall Street Week. Great to have you here. Let's start with the question of where growth will come on the other side of whatever it is we're going through, because that's ultimately going to be the question here. I understand from economists like you, it comes from one of two sources, either more workers or more productivity. Are we going to get more workers? We're looking at both fewer workers and lower productivity, as you know. So, let me focus on the fewer workers uh, aspect for a moment. The real issue, demographic issue facing the U.S. is we have a plummeting birth rate. And so total fertility in the U.S. is now below the level required to keep population growth constant. And so the issue here is that on average now, a woman in the U.S. is expected to have 1.65 children over her lifetime. So women used to have three kids, then it fell to two. Women were having comfortably above two kids for many decades. With a, with a fertility rate below two, that means our population is going to age and it's not going to grow. And so eventually we're going to have a shrinking working age population. Unless, Melissa, we have uh, immigration. That's and that's why immigration, I think many of us at this conference, feel is so very, very important. What's your sense of what economists would say, the politics apart, um, about the immigration policy? Economists love immigration. We think immigration is a, is a potential answer to our demographic challenges, as well as our productivity innovation challenges. Since immigrants come in, they work, they're more likely than native-born Americans to be entrepreneurs and innovators. Of course, as you know, Larry, immigration rates are way down. So we used to bring in, as you know, 2016, we had as many as a million new people coming into the country every year. That number is now below 250,000. And so the combination of a declining native-born population and a decline in immigration portends even worse demographic challenges than if we were just facing one versus the other. Let me see if I can do a little arithmetic based on what you said. From one million to yeah. 250,000. Yeah. So that's about 750,000 people a year. So that's about half a percent of our workforce, maybe a little less. So half a percent slower labor force uh, growth over time can accumulate to something uh, that, is very, that is very large. And, and if we go back to the birth rates, we have about 500,000 fewer babies being born a year than in the not distant past. Melissa, if you, um, what would you say about, about this? Um, most people are scared that immigrants come and they take jobs for Americans. And that if there are more immigrants, then there aren't going to be as many jobs for Americans. Or if there are jobs, because there's more competition, uh, they're going to be paid less. And that's true whether the job, people think, is working at McDonald's or is uh, working doing computer programming at Microsoft. What, how, do you, how should people feel? Shouldn't they, ha shouldn't they have this worry that they're going to be poorer if we take all the immigrants, just like they get hurt if we take a lot of, a lot of trade from other countries right. where they have much lower wages? So, so the reason economists are so bullish on immigration is because we have so much evidence that immigrants are good for the economy. They are good for most workers. But it is true that there are some groups in some places that will feel wage pressures. And I think the way we, the way we solve this issue is to make sure that we recognize the disparate impacts of certain groups. We recognize that low-wage workers in certain sectors might not experience the benefits, the overall benefits that immigrants bring to the economy, and we take steps to help them. I mean, it's not, it's not dissimilar to what we have to do with trade, too. You know, more imports is good for most people, but some people are harmed by it. 
We're going to see this too with the shift to green, a greener um, economy. Some people are going to lose their jobs, even though it's better for everyone. And so, I mean, I think acknowledging that some people feel and are harmed mm -hmm. by this, but that's a small concentrated group and taking steps to address that allows us to do things that make the economy grow and, right. and be more productive. General, I want to come back to fertility. Larry's pointed out a way in which economics, whether misperceived or not, may affect our willingness to have immigration. What about fertility? Are there economic causes for the reduction in fertility? So the decline in U.S. fertility, and it's really being driven by a plummeting of birth rates since 2007. Births fell after the Great Recession. They haven't recovered. Um, you can't point to any any policy or economic factor that's changed since 2007. So sometimes people will say things like childcare has become more expensive, and if we just made childcare less expensive, people would return to having more than two kids. I, I, there, I just not, that is just not the case, right? There's nothing uh, there's nothing that easy that we could point to. And in fact, U.S. women now are just having births in the same way that women in other high-income countries have reduced their birth rates long before in the 80s and 90s. So I don't think this is going to be easy to turn around. Lots of other countries have taken direct steps to try and incentivize people to have more kids. There's a lot of countries that have experimented with baby bonuses, a few thousand dollars. Birth rates go up a little bit in the following year, but nothing like the 20 percent increase in infertility we would need to get back to replacement level. Melissa, having an expert like you here, I can't resist uh, stepping out of our mutual lane as economists to ask a question I suspect is on many people's minds. Do you think that the recent Supreme Court decision and the steps that are going to be taken in a number of states, do you think that's going to materially affect the number of births in the United States? The we do have estimates on this based based on you know lots of data we have about how abortion restrictions you know lead to more birth rates. I expect there will be about uh, 100,000 more births a year. Um, so uh, yes, not this is this is not going to bring fertility rates back to where they were. This is going to mean that some women who wouldn't want to have a child now are going to. Um, since you raise the issue, I will say that this makes the imperative of doing more to support kids and low-income women in this country that much stronger. Hmm. Which is, you know, that, that was something that Congress was talking about for a brief moment uh, in the initial Build Back Better. That stuff got jettisoned. In the post-Dobbs decision paradigm, we are going to have some more births disproportionately born to low-income women, and we need to talk about how we're going to make sure that those children are well taken care of. So, Larry, can we make up uh, the loss of uh, population and workers with productivity? We have the Chips and Science Act now. We have the Inflation Reduction Act, both of which I understand are meant to increase productivity. Can we make it up and increase productivity? You know, Melissa organized a terrific session here on uh, R&D and science leadership uh, issues. I think there's a lot we can do, but it's both about spending money and it's about spending it well. There was the famous discovery of DNA by Crick and Watson. Today, people can't usually get their first grant until they're over 40. Hmm. And so I think we need to change the systems as well as putting more resources in if we want to maximize science, innovation, and their capacity for productivity. I think we've also got to have to think about a lot of things uh, post-COVID. David, can I, there's one other factor here. So we've talked about fewer working age people, less productivity per worker. We also have fewer working age people working. So the decline in labor force participation among people between the ages of 25 to 54 is yet another challenge that we're going to have to deal with in this country that's negatively going to impact growth going forward. It used to be that 95% of working age men were working. Today, it's 85% are working. That is an extra 10% of people who aren't having the satisfaction of work, aren't contributing to the economy, are much less well-placed to raise healthy, successful uh, families, are often angered and alienated uh, from our society. And so we tend to think of, on shows like this, uh, the path of uh, fortunate college-educated uh, workers. We have got to be uh, thinking about that large group of men, men much more than women, who are uh, really struggling uh, in our country right now and what can be done um, from childhood on to maximize their opportunities. Yeah, it's such an important point. And as you know, both of you know well, there's been some serious economic work suggesting that opioids actually have been a non, not insignificant contributor to that problem. Thank you so much. It's been a great discussion. I wish I were out there and asked with you. I could learn a lot more. But thank you so much to our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard, and Melissa Carney, professor of economics at the University of Maryland. Coming up, it's one thing to handpick your successor. It's quite another to make it work. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. And it's moving both Citadel and Citadel Securities to Miami. The scoop was broken by Bloomberg's Amanda Gordon.
unlocked early enough all these precious materials you were just mentioning and we were on the lucky side that our prognosis was spot on in a way uh, forecasting what kind of uh, material we would need and uh, what quantity we would need finally one more thought heavy is the head that wears the crown at least according to shakespeare's henry the fourth and it's not only heavy it's hard to pass that crown onto the next head at least judging by how often it doesn't seem to work we don't have to go all the way back to Lear to find leaders bungling their succession plans. We have divided in three our kingdom. It is our fast intent to shake all players in business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths. We all know how that worked out for King Lear. There are plenty of more recent examples, though, particularly in the world of business, like Jack Welch anointing Jeff Immelt to carry on his legend at GE, something that didn't work out so well, although Jeff seemed to be the last to know when he spoke to our John Micklesweight in 2017, not long before he had his crown removed. We always have a group of successors, and I always think you, you got to earn it every day, so... I've been doing it a while, I feel great, and we'll see where it goes. Or Kevin Johnson, who had the bad fortune to be the second CEO to replace Starbucks chief Howard Schultz, only to be succeeded by, you guessed it, Howard Schultz. Though when I spoke with Kevin in 2019, he admitted that it was tricky. In a transition from founder-led to founder-inspired, those transitions oftentimes are the most difficult and the most critical transition that any company will go through. And this week, we got yet another example, when the founders of the Carlyle Group announced that their hand-picked heir, Chusan Lee, would be leaving abruptly to be replaced, at least temporarily, by Bill Conway, one of those founders who picked him. This has definitely shaken the investment universe. Let's not be coy about it. 10 p.m. Eastern on a Sunday night. Uh, and remember, like I said, he's stepping down before the contract is even up. But it wasn't only Q. Lee who stepped down this week. We also saw a legend prepare to move on when Serena Williams, arguably the greatest of all time in women's tennis, announced that she would be retiring after the U.S. Open this year, something she had just joked about earlier. Every tennis player thinks about the R word as soon as they hit five years. <laughs> and when it comes to Serena, I'm not sure that we're going to see any successor anytime soon. So given how much drama there is around the subject, it shouldn't be surprising that there is a hit TV drama series given over to the matter of succession. Because it's one thing to know the boss has to go. It's quite another to figure out who should be the new boss, especially if you're warring with family members. He's erratic. He's making bad decisions. If he's not careful, he's going to destroy the company. Emily, you going to do something? I think I'm the best option. Oh, right, because you like playing boss? That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week. This month, as the world watches inflation rise, employment rebound, and fiscal policies react, all roads lead to Jackson Hole for the Kansas City Fed's 2022 Economic Policy Symposium. Bloomberg's all-star team is live as policymakers and financial insiders discuss the economic issues and solutions that keep the world's money moving. Coverage starts August 25th, only on Bloomberg Television and Radio. When you think of cutting-edge technology at sea, you might be thinking of stuff like this. But there's an incoming revolution on the high seas that isn't quite as sexy, but could be significantly more impactful. Container shipping is the key component of global trade. About 80 or 90% of all the world's goods are transported at sea at some point. But there's a significant unseen cost to the modern era of global commerce. About 3% of all the world's CO2 emissions come from shipping. 3% may not sound like a lot, but that's roughly comparable to the entire CO2 output of Germany. Since reducing trade isn't a likely option, what about a technological improvement to help reduce the emissions from these well-stocked maritime behemoths? Thank you, Andy, so much for coming down. It's really wonderful to have you here in person. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks and for having me. I just found out we actually lived in the same dorm in college just a few years apart. So it's been almost a year since you took over from Jeff as CEO of Amazon, and it's been a year of firsts, the first stock split since the dot-com boom, the first vote to unionize an Amazon warehouse, your first Bloomberg Technology Conference. Thank you. I want to start with a quick report card.
In February 2021, Jeff Bezos shocked the world by announcing plans to step down as Amazon CEO. A few months later, he passed the reins to Andy Jassy, his longtime top lieutenant, the architect of one of the company's biggest profit engines, Amazon Web Services. Bezos has stayed on as executive chair, leaving Jassy to navigate a critical inflection point in Amazon's history. How does the company manage market turmoil, rising inflation, and regulatory scrutiny, and a push by some warehouse workers to unionize, all while keeping customers coming back? Joining me on this edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Amazon's second CEO, Andy Jassy. He joined us from our flagship Bloomberg Technology Summit in San Francisco. I'd like you to grade your view of Amazon's performance. And we've got time later to, to really dig in. But quickly, how would you grade Amazon's performance over the last year with customers? Well, I think we, you know, I'm not sure I'm the right person to grade uh, myself uh, during the year <laughs> or not, but I, I'll give you my take. You know, I think with respect to customers, I think we've done a lot of good. You know, and, and I think if you look at during the pandemic, which really has extended till the early part of this year, uh, you know, so much of the PPE and food and um, essential items and people equipping their home offices were bought from Amazon and, and you know, to scale the way we needed to. Remember, in 2020, we grew 39% year over year on a $245 billion revenue run rate. I mean, it's, very, it's unprecedented. It's never happened before. But it was really hard to do that. And we had to take the really big footprint, uh, a fulfillment center footprint. We built the first 25 years of Amazon and double it in 24 months. We built out that transportation network in just a couple of years. Uh, you know, we nearly doubled the size of our workforce during that time. And I think you saw it in other businesses. You know, AWS is a really big part of helping companies and governments have business continuity during the pandemic. And so many companies and organizations in the last year made the strategic decision that they were going to stop running their own infrastructure technology and disproportionately chose AWS to help them move to the cloud and we spent a lot of time helping them make that transformation. So what about investors? I mean the stock is down significantly from a peak last year. Yeah. Obviously there's broader market turmoil. Yeah I think you know for investors and financially I'd say it's mixed. You know I think we have some businesses that are growing really strongly. If you look at AWS, you know, in, in 2021, grew 37 percent year over year. You know, it's not a 74 billion dollar revenue run rate business. It's pretty unusual growth, and we grew 58 percent year over year in our advertising business. You know, it's a 32 billion dollar revenue run rate business. So some businesses growing really strongly, and you know, we've continued to grow in our retail business despite pretty crazy comparables during 2020. But I think the real challenge for us there is on the cost side, and there have been several things that have happened. Um, some of which are more controllable than others. You know, I think the part that's less controllable is really around inflation. And I think we thought that inflation would start to attenuate in 2022. And with the war in Ukraine, it just went the other way and has significantly accelerated. And so the cost of trucking and line haul and ocean and air and fuel has just substantially gone up. And uh, I think that will attenuate at some point. No one knows how long that'll take. I think the more controllable areas for us are really around fulfillment center capacity and productivity. It was taking about 24 months to build new fulfillment centers during the pandemic. And so we had to make decisions, you know, in mid-2020 and early 2021 on how much demand we were going to plan for. And so, you know, we, we end up with more capacity than we need right, right now. And, and there's a number of things that we're working on. We, we've stopped building on properties where we don't need it yet. And we've let a number of leases lapse. And not a small number, you know, of, of both those things. We've had a lot of occasions in our history where we've worked on productivity and made improvements. And we have a lot of clearly defined initiatives. And I'm confident we're going to get back to the right level of profitability. You are going to sublease 30 million square feet of space. Is there a mistake in the execution there because of the overbuilding? Again, because you have to make these decisions two years in advance. And again, if you put yourself back in 2020, where we were growing 39% year over year on a $245 billion revenue run rate, it's very hard to know what's the right amount to build. And you have to make a decision. And we made the decision to err on the side of our consumers and sellers. Now, how would you grade Amazon's performance with employees, your colleagues? There has been some high profile. Time. Yeah, I think that um, when I started in this gig, we had just uh, created a new leadership principle to strive to be Earth's best employer. And I think we're, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to think through what that really means. It's broad. And, uh, and I think we've made a fair bit of progress, but it's still early, in my opinion. But I still think there are many areas that we can keep improving. You know, and, and I think, um, you know, the first one I, I'd mention is safety. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, in our fulfillment centers, that is the top priority. And, you know, when you get into the details and numbers and outside of all the spin of it all, you know, we're about average there, but we're not trying to be average. You know, we want to be the best in the industry and the best in the world at it. And that's a high priority and, and an area that I'm passionate about and the team is passionate about. And I think we have a lot of work we can do to make our employees' everyday lives easier. And we have, we've identified kind of a top 100 list of, of areas that we can be better at that we are just uh, metronomically stepping through. And so we've made a lot of progress, but we have a lot of work to do still. Elon Musk just came out saying he has a super bad feeling about the economy, Tesla laying off 10% of his staff. Jamie Dimon says he's preparing for an economic hurricane. The World Bank just slashed its forecast for global growth. How do you feel about the economic climate? Well, I wasn't planning on giving any guidance. Here, right? <laughs> Please. <laughs> but, uh, super you know, bad or super, I, I super think, bad? Uh, <laughs> I think uh, there's some things as it relates to Amazon that are um, useful to remember. You know, I, I think the first piece is, remember that 85% of the, of the worldwide retail market segment share is offline. And if you believe that that equation is going to flip at some point, which we do, I think it will, it will flip over a long period of time. If you look at different downturns, um, you know, should we have one at some point? And we've been through a few, obviously, in the 25 years that I've been at Amazon. Customers change their habits. And so you know, I also think there's you know, those two reasons, those two factors give me some optimism that even if we have a downturn, that we have the potential to still grow. We have a roadmap that's you know, probably three to five years long. We're going to continue to invent. We're going to continue to be insurgent. And we have a lot of work to do to get to where we think we ultimately can get for customers. Now, when it comes to the stock, as I mentioned, um, it has fallen significantly. Do you think investors are missing something? Or has tech just been overvalued? And this also, of course, matters to employees who are significantly paid in stock. 
Well, you know, look, I haven't been at Amazon for 25 years. I arrived at the company three weeks before we went public. I have never tried to predict what stock's going to do. And any time I've tried to a little bit, I've been wrong. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's pretty, hard to, um, uh, pretty hard to predict what's going to be in any short period of time. I do really believe that Benjamin, you know, that Benjamin Graham maxim that um, in the short term, the stock market tends to be a voting machine. In the long term, it tends to be a weighing machine. And I think if you, you know, we've been through a lot of points in 25 years been at Amazon where um, the macro factors are off and um, stocks are down, our stock is down. But you can't really control that. You know, we have a concept we talk about a lot at Amazon, inputs and outputs. You know, and the ultimate output for a company is share price. You know, and then other big outputs are free cash flow or profit or revenue. You can't really manage the outputs. You have to manage at the input level. And that's where we spend all our time. And so if you do the right things for the business long term, things tend to work out. I think we've had very good returns for investors. And I expect that to be true again. Do you see Amazon's strategy as fundamentally different from Netflix and Disney? And if so, how? No one covers the world like Bloomberg. That's a sense of get to 7% in the coming months. Do you see that coming through? There was something of a gray zone battle between Taiwan and China. Where are the job cuts to come from? We will not just cut and run. With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks, 24 hours a day. Bloomberg, your global business authority. It is crucially important, and I think we've moved from this attitude from it's an indulgence, a waste of time, almost an illness that needs a cure. For something as universally important to human life as sleep, mysteries surrounding its necessity and utility have only just been recently uncovered. Some of our biggest discoveries were in the 1970s or 1980s, and so it makes it a really exciting field, because it seems as though we're uncovering new insights each and every day. Some scientists are going further to find out how sleep and what happens there can be harnessed to further expand our understanding. It's easy to memorize things. That makes you smart if you can spit back a lot of facts. But if you want to be wise, if you really want wisdom, you've got to know when and how and why to use that information. And that's what your brain figures out while you're sleeping. What are the moonshots at Amazon that are capturing most of your time and attention? What is going to define the next era of Amazon? I mean, is it is it Astro the home robot or is it something else? <laughs> well, you know, we have a unique way that we look at big new investments. And I'm not sure it's right or wrong. It just happens to be our way. And we ask ourselves when we're considering something, four questions. We, we ask, uh, if it's successful, can it be big and move the needle at Amazon? Is being well served today? Do we have a differentiated approach? And do we have competence there? And if not, can we acquire it quickly? If we like the answer to those questions, we'll go pursue it with a single thread team that isn't distracted by the rest of the business. And sometimes that leads to uh, innovation and investments that seem pretty obvious. Like, you know, when I got to that company, it was a books only retailer. And then we expanded to music and video and electronics and books. It seemed obvious to people. Other times, that process does not lead to investments that seem obvious to people. I mean, AWS was something that people externally and internally thought was a little bit nutty at the time. But just imagine what Amazon would be today without AWS. And, and I think that you see the same thing here. Uh, you know, the, there are so many significant investments we're making that I'm excited about. I'm going to have to constrain myself to a few. But you know, I, I'm really excited about what we're doing in the Prime Video space. Um, I think we're clearly on the right track there and building a significant business. That's interesting because Netflix also just announced some layoffs, yeah. first subscriber loss in a decade, Disney cutting back on costs. Do you see Amazon's strategy as fundamentally different from Netflix and Disney? And if so, how? Well, I, you know, we're very bullish on it. And uh, remember, we, you know, all the all of the models are a little bit different, but for Prime Video, we have 200 million plus Prime subscribers who are, you know, get that entertainment for free by being part of, of Prime. And, and so we have a little bit different um, pricing model than some of the others, but I, I'm incredibly encouraged by what we have coming. If you, if you look, I mean, we launched the show Reacher earlier in the year. It was a huge um, hit. We, you know, we had the new Maisel um, season. We, we just launched a new Boys season, which is Are you a big Boys fan? I'm a, I am a big Boys fan. Is Amazon bought? It's very good. <laughs> of course, we have Lord of the Rings coming up, you know, in, in September and Thursday Night Football. So I, I'm very bullish about it. Um, we also, you know, uh, we're excited about what we've done with MGM. Uh, uh, you know, I think some of the assets there will go very well with the rest of what we're doing entertainment-wise. And so if you look at Warner Brothers Discovery and Paramount and Stars and Global, they're building really significant subscription businesses. So I'm very bullish about that business. I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that we have a chance to build a significant grocery business, which is, you know, early stages for us. I, I, I'm excited about... Um, uh, Kuiper, which is our low Earth orbit satellite that we're building. You've got to remember there are 300 to 400 million people in the world who have limited to no internet connectivity. I mean, just think about how different the world is when you don't have that type of connectivity. And so I think that's a really significant opportunity that has some AWS characteristics to it. I continue to be very optimistic about Alexa, you know, building the world's best personal assistant. Um, we have, you know, 200 million endpoints already that are using Alexa. We're clearly onto something there. And, and then, you know, our autonomous driving ride hailing service in Zooks that we're building, you know, here in the Bay Area. I just think with the way auto consumption is evolving, I think that also is a chance to be a really significant business. Now, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if all of them are going to be successful, but if any one of them becomes the fourth pillar for us on top of Marketplace and Prime and AWS, we're a completely different company, just like we were when AWS became successful. So I think they're very worthwhile investments and bets, and I'm optimistic about them. You didn't mention Astro, obviously, though, powered you by Alexa. Astro, though, yeah. But, I mean, are home robots going to be zooming? I don't yet. Okay. Where is it? Idiot. It's not really yeah. widely available right. for sale. What's the status? I hope you get one. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Everyone's very curious about Jeff's role these days, what kind of executive chair he really is. He said when he left that he focused his attention and energies on initiatives that he really cares about as, at Amazon, but from the outside, it looks like he's really focusing on philanthropy, he's focusing on space. What kind of an executive chairman is he? 
Well, he, you know, Jeff is always going to be um, involved, and um, he has, you know, I, I'm, I feel very lucky to have been at Amazon for 25 years. I feel very lucky to have worked directly for Jeff for 20 of them. And we have a, a really close relationship and have for a long time, and I think we share a lot of the same values about customers and um, how important it is to optimize for customers and how high standards they need to be, um, you know, given how easy it is for people to switch and the importance of invention and speed. And so, you know, I, I just feel very lucky to have had the chance to work so closely with him. So is your relationship, I mean, he was your only boss for 25 years, right? Is 20. your relationship fundamentally different? than it was when you were the head of Yeah, AWS. of course. You know, every, every single job you have, the relationship's different. You know, remember, my, the first couple years I worked for Jeff, I worked as what we call the shadow then, which was really like a chief of staff. And that was different than when I was starting AWS, which was different from when we got AWS going, and it was you know, a business that was starting to do well. And, and it's different when I'm in the CEO role. But you know, the constant has always been that we have a great relationship, and we collaborate really well. Amazon is poised to become the biggest private sector employer in the world. Second only, uh, right now, Walmart is, is in that spot. But Amazon will probably soon surpass it. First vote to unionize at an Amazon warehouse. I know you've been spending a lot of time at warehouses. When you look at someone like Chris Smalls, who I think some people look at as this modern day hero who got fired, pulled off this union vote, what's your message to someone like him? Your message to the folks who think maybe we should join a union? Well, I, you know, I think that you know, the first thing to be clear about is that employees get to make that choice, whether they want to have a union or not. They always have had that choice, and it continues to be their choice. And you know, we happen to think they're better off without a union for a number of reasons, um, including the fact that you know, it's, it's much harder uh, when you have a union to have a direct relationship with your manager and to get things done quickly. So if you see something on the line that you think would be better for your, your team or you or your or, or customers, you can't just go to your manager and say, let's change this. You know, there's a whole process in, in bureaucracy that you have to go through to be able to do that. You know, and, and we get, you know, when there's a union, we're going to get the feedback filtered by what the union decides is worth um, bringing up. And we'd much rather hear from every employee whatever is on their mind. And so, you know, I think if you want to continue to have the structure that we've had for all this time, you have to have really competitive benefits. And then I think if you look at Amazons, they're very unusual in this space. We championed the $15 minimum wage um, several years ago. The starting salary is now over $18 an hour, which you know is, is more than double the federal minimum wage. You get full um, health insurance and 401k and 20 weeks, up to 20 weeks of parental leave. And if you want to get college education, you haven't had one, we have a career choice program that lets our fulfillment center uh, uh, associates be able to do so. That is a very unusual and compelling set of benefits. And those were all accomplished without a union. So, you know, I think that we realize that we, you know, we have to continue to work on the relationship with our, um, our employees and we need to continue to provide the, the right benefits and you know, we need to continue to work on safety and, and that's our intention. You made a huge mark on Amazon with AWS, obviously. What is the mark that you want to make still? Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials, find people, analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Why do the biggest names in business choose Bloomberg? That is a great question. It's a great question. It's a great question. Great question. Great question. Great question. Great question. That's going to be the best question I get all night. I'm glad you asked that. Bloomberg Television. Top experts. Great questions. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. The FTC has revamped its antitrust inquiry into Amazon and by some accounts is accelerating it. Are you preparing for an antitrust lawsuit from the FTC? If you are a large company that's growing as, to a significant extent like we have, you have to be prepared to be scrutinized. And, and we have known this for some time, you know, many years. And we have tried to run the company with that in mind and knowing that if, if somebody looked, that we would stand up to that scrutiny. And I, you know, I think that's what we've tried to do in running the business. We can't control what, you know, you know, whether um, organizations bring different suits against us. But I think if you look at our business, if you actually look at the fact, if you take out of, you know, take out of the equation that there, there may not be the most objective you know, leadership when it comes to Amazon in that organization, if you look at the facts, you know, in our retail business, we're about 1% of the worldwide retail market segment share. And remember, 85% of it is still offline. And if you look in our AWS business, we, you know, about, depending on how you measure it, 95% of the worldwide global IT spend is on-premises. You know, and then we have a cloud business, and then we have a portion of that. You know, we have a leading um, market segment share in the cloud part of this, but we operate, you know, who we compete with in AWS is really on-premises um, IT in addition to the cloud. So, you know, these are relatively small percentages of, of the entire pie. And you can kind of step through all the businesses. And I think simply because you've been successful in a few different businesses doesn't somehow mean that you have unnatural market power. It just means you've been successful in a couple different customer experiences, but we still have a, a relatively small amount of market segment share in those areas. What about the SEC? You're being sued by them over third-party data and how you've used it. Do you think in the past Amazon made mistakes with letting employees internally see how those third-party sellers were doing? We have, we have pretty good control. I mean, we, you know, we of course disagree with the premise mm -hmm. uh, of that, but I would say that we have 
um, very good controls with respect to the data that, um, that different employee sets are able to see. And um, by the way, I think that we can be better for sellers. You know, I, I think that um, you know, we can have better tools for them to get started. We can have better tools for them to manage what they're doing um, across their, their um, different Amazon units. I think we can communicate better. There's a whole bunch of things we can do better. Um, and we agonize over every single email or communication we get from sellers. And we do very regularly robust surveying. And a lot more sellers are happy with Amazon than unhappy with Amazon. And I think if you look at what, what they're able to do is, you know, as a business by virtue of selling on Amazon versus not, it completely changes what's possible. Sellers don't really long for e-commerce software. That exists in lots of places, and, uh, and it's not very expensive. What they love about selling on Amazon is that they get access to our hundreds of millions of customers, and that completely changes what their prospects can be in terms of the businesses they're building. So we have a lot of work to do there like we do in a lot of other places, but I, I think we have a very strong partnership with sellers. What's the view of the supply chain right now and how much pain there is going to continue to be and for how long? Well, you know, I think that... Um, there's a lot of challenges in the, in the supply chain still. I mean, it's, it's gotten better than it was, but um, there are all sorts of challenges. You know, non-perishable goods, electronics, chips is still a really, you know, a significant issue for all sorts of businesses. We have worked really hard to open a lot more um, uh, points of presence and ports and, and increase our capacity in getting products in, but I think it's going to be something that companies battle with for some time. You made a huge mark on Amazon with AWS, obviously. What is the mark that you want to make still on Amazon? I mean, in this new role, what's going to define the Andy Jassy era? <laughs> Well, I, I, don't, I don't really think of it that way, Emily. I mean, I, um, I don't think it's really about an Andy Jassy era or, or any one person. You know? and, and, uh, and by the way, AWS was not about any one person. That, you know, if you spend any time on AWS, that is an unbelievable team, um, not just an incredible leadership team, which it is, but just top to bottom. I mean, the number of inventors and people who care about customers and operate you know, uh, something where it has to work almost like a dial tone. It's, it's always teams. And so I look at every single one of our businesses and you know, you take our retail business or our consumer business, which is the oldest of our businesses, 85% of it still lives offline. <laughs> like, I, I think we have a lot of upside and a lot of growth. And I think as much invention as we've seen the last 25 years, you know, the time I've been there, I think it's, it's going to look small compared to the next 25 years. There is a lot for us to invent on behalf of customers. And so you know, I'm excited to be part of the team that makes that happen. You know, we are continuing to, you know, to increase the amount that we give back to the communities in which we have a big presence. And that really matters to me. I think we have a responsibility to do that. And um, so you know, it's, it's, it's a long journey you know, that we're working on. But I'm, I'm excited to be part of it. And uh, you know, I hope to be part of it for a long time. Well, thank you for joining us and telling us about the way the journey is going so far. Thank you very much. Andy Jassy, of Amazon. Thanks. So for somebody who's watching this and wants to be a successful global business leader, what are the skill sets? I would prepare well before I got the job or was given the nod. during this period of time is that communicating via video is not a fad, that we are using it in all aspects of our lives, for work, for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. A lot of the satellites have propulsion systems they can kind of move to get out of the way of each other or change their orbit a little bit. It's a service that you guys offer to help these companies know how to maneuver their machines. Yeah, we offer a collision avoidance service. It's a subscription service. We'll send you an alert up to seven days in advance if your satellite's going to come dangerously close to a piece of debris or another satellite. Companies have been doing that for decades, moving satellites around, but it's, it's sort of like a harder problem now. The risk of a collision is a lot higher now just because we've installed so much more hardware into space. You have a big collision, it creates a cloud of debris, and now all the other satellites are flying through this whizzing mess uh, of debris. As we add all of the new satellites into space, the risks of the collision, the likelihood of the collision is going up.
You're watching the best of the Qatar Economic Forum. I'm Anish Cranny in Doha. This week's event, which was powered by Bloomberg, brought together global business leaders and heads of state to tackle some of the world's most pressing challenges, from snarled supply chains and escalating inflation to Russia's military assault on Ukraine. Over the next half hour, we'll bring you all the highlights from the most important interviews and conversations, beginning with Elon Musk, the world's richest person, spoke to Bloomberg's editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite about his headcount plans at Tesla, why he thinks a recession is inevitable, and of course, his ongoing bid for Twitter. With respect to the, the Twitter transaction, there's a limit to what I can say publicly, given that is um, somewhat of a sensitive matter. Um, <laughs> so I, I like to be measured in my responses here, um, such as not to generate uh, incremental lawsuits. Um, <laughs> that, seems, that seems to be a risk you sometimes manage to overcome. <laughs> yes, a, a deposition minimization is, uh, I think, important. <laughs> uh, have, you, so, you have, has, have Twitter given you enough information? Well, there are still um, a few unresolved matters. Uh, you've, you've probably read about the, the question as to whether the number of uh, fake and spam users on the system is less than 5% as Twitter claims, um, which I think is probably not most people's experience uh, on when using Twitter. Um, so we're still awaiting resolution on that matter. Um, and that, that is uh, a very significant matter. Um, so uh, we're, we're awaiting resolution on that. Um, and then, of course, uh, there is the question of uh, will the, uh, the debt portion of the uh, round uh, come together? And then will the shareholders vote in favor? So I think those are the three things that um, uh, stand in the, uh, you know, that need to be resolved before uh, the transaction can be complete. What about the general state of the economy? Does that weigh on you when you think about this? I mean, you just described it. You have a super bad feeling about the economy. Are you still in that position? I just said to you earlier, Joe Biden has just come out and said that a recession in America is not inevitable. How do you feel about the economy? Well, I think a recession is inevitable at some point. Um, as to whether there is a recession in the near term, um, I think that is more likely than not. Uh, it certainly isn't a, it's not a certainty, but um, it appears more likely than not. Um, what do you think? I'm, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> I agree with you. I think it's more likely. Can I ask you yeah. one particular thing to do with the Twitter bid, which is, you know, you are one of the biggest and fastest growing um, investors in China. Tesla, you've talked about it being a third of your sales going forward. You're now buying Twitter, the kind of public forum for free speech. The Chinese historically don't tend to be very enthusiastic about free speech. Do, are you worried about whether you can keep those two particular horses running? Is, is buying Twitter going to get you in trouble with the Chinese? Well, uh, Twitter does not uh, operate in China, yes. so, um, and I think uh, China does not uh, attempt to interfere, interfere with the uh, free speech of the, of the press in the U.S. Uh, as, as far as I know, because I, I assume you're not under pressure to at Bloomberg to uh, from China. So I think there's, um, I, I don't think this is going to be an issue. And in terms generally of that issue of freedom of speech and Twitter, you've talked about Twitter being making it even freer and letting more people onto it. Um, is there a limit yeah. at all to, to who you think should be allowed onto Twitter? My aspiration for Twitter or in general for the digital town square would be that it is as inclusive uh, in, in the broader sense of the word as possible. Um, that it is, it is an appealing uh, system to use. Um, so, I mean, ideally I'd like to get like 80% of, uh, let's say, North America and perhaps, I don't know, half the world or something ultimately on, on Twitter in, in one form or another. And that means, that means it must be something that is appealing to people. It, it also cannot be a place where they feel uncomfortable or harassed um, or they'll simply not use it. Can you set the record straight on one thing, which is this issue about the layoffs? I think you said initially that Tesla, 10% of the workforce would be cut, then 10% of salary would be cut, then salary would stay fl flat and overall headcount would go up. W w what is the number? I know there's already, I think, been a, a lawsuit about the 10%. Is 10% is the goal to reduce the workforce? Or what is the number that we should think about or that you're planning? So Tesla is reducing the salary workforce by roughly 10% um, over the next probably three months or so. Um, the, uh, we expect to grow our, our um, hourly workforce. Uh, it's quite clear that we expect to grow our, our hourly workforce, um, but we, uh, we grew very fast with, on, the, on the salaried side um, and we grew a little too fast in some areas. And so it requires a reduction in the salaried workforce. And we're about two thirds uh, hourly and one third salary. So I guess technically a 10% reduction in the salary workforce is only roughly a three, three and a half percent reduction in total headcount. So Elon Musk thinks a recession is inevitable. Egypt's finance minister doesn't think we're in one yet, but does reckon the economy is slowing. I caught up with Mohammed May. No, we are not uh, already in a recession, but uh, we have now uh, an, a downgrading uh, of economic uh, recovery. We have seen uh, uh, World Bank, IMF, and others uh, have reduced their uh, expectation for economic growth. But if the current direction uh, to be continued and uh, might be even escalated, I believe that uh, inevitably we will go for recession. And do you see that because of higher interest rates that are coming to bear in your economy and the global economy? It's a package of elements will work together, leading us uh, to recession. Inflation, high cost of financing, food security, 
concern about the war and the extent of the war and whether this war can be accelerated somewhere uh, way or another and also pressure on many developing countries in this world which can contribute heavily to economic growth will uh, have to suffer from the negative impact which will be at the expense of their ability to grow. Are you in shock or panic over fuel and food at the moment? Uh, panic rather than a shock. I believe that um, if uh, things will accelerate further, it will uh, materialize to a big shock. The consequence of food and fuel is 13% core inflation, sir. I've had people tell me inflation is topping out. It's, it's, it's over. Second half of the year to get better. Do you share that view? Do you think inflation has plateaued or topped out? Uh, expectation is to increase, not to decrease. Significantly? Uh, it depends. Uh, if, food, uh, if oil prices will continue this trend, if uh, food prices continue to this trend, if the federals and other central banks will increase uh, interest further, definitely we will go for further inflation. Particularly that um, you know, uh, we may start to see, uh, in addition to what we have seen until now, uh, more interruption to trade, more interruption to supply chain, and uh, difficulties to get financing. So it's 13% on the core at the moment. How, how bad could it get? Uh, if you are talking about Egypt in particular, Indeed, sir. Uh, 13 percent, um, you know, will depend on uh, how much uh, inflation we are importing. This is a significant part. Uh, why? Because uh, if inflation accelerates further in Europe, in the United States of America, as a result of all these factors, and in addition to that, higher interest rate will add to higher cost of financing, uh, this will uh, mean that uh, we will be negatively impacted. We hope that this will not be materialized in the coming period. So we should, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm worried also about how the monetary policy as a central bank of Egypt will look at, at the situation, whether they will uh, increase uh, further uh, 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 basis point uh, for their base rate. They have already increased 300 basis point, and uh, we don't know what will be their uh, decisions uh, very soon uh, uh, to react to uh, inflation. So you are worried about further significant rate hikes from the central bank? Yes, I'm worried, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, we can let the uh, uh, Egyptian economy to grow, and uh, high cost of financing, uh, it will be a problem for the uh, industry, for the financing cost for the economy, but eventually uh, inflation is a core business, co inflation control is part of the core business for central Bank of Egypt. Up next, the Deputy Chairman and CEO of the Kuwait Petroleum Corporation tells us how much of a premium he thinks the war in Ukraine has put in the oil prices. This is Bloomberg. happening on Wall Street. I think Jay Powell said things that were indefensible. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. We think that's the next secular shift. From business's most influential and instrumental. Yes, it's about renewables. It's a challenging dynamic. This is a level of uncertainty that we haven't had to deal with. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. One covers the world like Bloomberg. This says will get to 7% in the coming months. Do you see that coming true? There was something of a grey zone battle between Taiwan and China. Where are the job cuts to come from? We will not just cut and run. With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks, 24 hours a day. Bloomberg, your global business authority. You're welcome back to the best of the Qatar Economic Forum. Energy was, of course, the major theme of the week. And the deputy chair and CEO of the Kuwait Petroleum Corporation told us he thinks the war in Ukraine has only highlighted how important energy is to the world. Sheikh Nawaf al-Sabah reckons the conflict has put a $30 barrel premium into the oil market. He caught up with my colleague, Francine Lacroix. We think that uh, oil is there for the long term in terms of even in any energy transition. So. We may be concerned about what, what obviously uh, the next 18 months is going to do for financing uh, uh, and, and for our cash balances, but over the long term, we're quite uh, confident that oil will remain uh, at, at stable and, and good enough uh, prices. How does the short term, yeah. the war in Ukraine, of course, what we're seeing with COVID, change the energy transition? So the IEA said, look, we have to stop with fossil fuels, we're going to save our planet. Does that get pushed back? No, you have to you have to keep an eye on that as well. But the the mistake that a lot of us have, a lot of people have made uh, before the, the, the Ukraine war was to say this is going to be a war against fossil fuels and that we must stop uh, oil production. Well, the world is using more carbon now than it ever did before, and uh, this crisis in, in Ukraine. Uh, next to all the humanitarian issues that uh, come with it, uh, shows you that energy is required to fuel the future. And hydrocarbons uh, have a, a big role to play. Now, 
can we make the hydrocarbons cleaner and, and uh, more efficient? Absolutely, that's how, what we're trying to do and that's what we're investing in, whether it's through carbon capture utilization and storage, uh, using carbon as EOR processes, or uh, uh, really abating the carbon footprint of the oil barrel. We're in Kuwait, uh, and I mentioned this earlier today, we're in Kuwait at the lowest end of the cost curve, both in yeah. cash cost and carbon footprint. Now, we need to stay there. That's going to require a lot of investment. But there are many people, if, if you speak to climate activists, I mean, they say it's just bad. So d does the crisis actually in the war in Ukraine mean that we'll reach peak oil a lot longer? No, we I don't see think more so. investment no. in the short term or no? No, you will see continued investment. I mean, at prices where they are, that is yeah. spurring investment. You're seeing some, some uh, uh, rigs coming back into, into uh, action in Permian, and you're seeing the U.S. production going up uh, over time. Uh, you're seeing a lot of us also continuing to, to, to produce. Now, uh, for, for uh, companies like KPC, we look at the long term, so we're investing right, right through the cycle. Yeah. But uh, companies that uh, that don't do that are, are putting in more investment right now. The, cash, the, game, the, the question right now is really about the cash cost of, uh, of those investments with inflation and, and uh, steel prices and whatnot yeah. uh, going through the roof. It's going to be an, an issue. But the oil price and the energy price is so high right now. When are you expecting these prices to stabilize? I see a, a war premium of about $30 in the current price right now. That, uh, But for uh, the war in, in Ukraine, you'd probably be seeing, seeing uh, about $80, $90 uh, barrel oil, which is not that high. Uh, and that is adjusted for inflation over the past period. It's, it's actually, you know, it takes you back to the, the, the last big bump that we had, so, somewhere in the $60, $70 range, which is still comfortable. And remember, the, the energy intensity of the world economy is about a third of what it was about 20 years ago, and it's continuing to go down. So oil prices, yes, they do impact uh, economic growth to a certain extent, but the, 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 um, uh, the size of that impact has, has diminished incredibly. Do you see any demand disruption in our conversation? Where right now, I don't see it. Anywhere. I, I see demand curtailment of yeah. growth. Uh, I haven't yet seen demand disruption. We're getting the same calls from our customers say, demanding the same amount of oil and in some cases a little bit more. Up next, Steve Mnuchin on why he has a lot of confidence in Jay Powell in the fight against inflation. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars, only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. So for somebody who's watching this and wants to be a successful global business leader, what are the skill sets? I would prepare well before I got the job or was given the nod. Welcome back to the best of Qatar Economic Forum. Former Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin says inflation in the U.S. can be brought under control. If energy prices settle down, then the Federal Reserve follows through on its pledge to continue raising interest rates. He spoke to Bloomberg's Eric Chatzka. I do have a lot of confidence in, in Chair Powell. By the way, it's fun I can now talk about the Fed. I wasn't allowed to talk about Fed policy for many years. You know, I guess my, my most important advice to the administration is don't do anything to shock the economy. So uh, they had been talking about raising taxes. They had been talking about making different changes. Now, now is not the time to put any additional shocks. Th things like gas tax on the margin may help a little bit, but this is really now the Federal Reserve's job, and the administration needs to be careful not to get in the way. I do think you know, the number one thing the administration can do, and I think it's not just them, it's obviously other world leaders, is we need to find a political solution to this war. The, the, the military solution alone is, is not going to be what stops this. You have confidence in Chairman Powell, right. whom you know well, having worked together with him and other members of the Federal Reserve. The reality, however, is that financial markets aren't certain whether they have confidence in Chairman Powell. There's a growing consensus that the Federal Reserve isn't raising rates fast enough, and the Fed lost credibility uh, with its perspective on inflation that it was transitory. Two questions. Do you think that the Federal Reserve needs to raise rates at a faster clip than they have outlined for the American public, and for that matter, for the world? And what will it take to restore that lost credibility? Well, let me just say, it wasn't just the Federal Reserve. The administration also was uh, talking about inflation would be under control. So, you know, I think from the Fed standpoint, in hindsight, they clearly waited too long. But having said that, when you're managing the economy and you're the Federal Reserve, I think you have to balance both sides of that equation. Um, I don't buy that the Fed has lost credibility. Um, I think the fact that the Fed moved in 75 basis points, which a month ago was not what the market expected. I think Chair Powell has now signaled another 75 basis points. 
Um, I think if you look at the dot plots, which I never was a big fan of these dot plots, but that's a, a, another story. Um, you know, I think the market understands that expectations are the Fed is the Fed's going to raise rates. I think the portfolio is just as important, and they're they're beginning to slow that down. Um, you know, look, a year ago I said we're going to have ten-year Treasuries three to three and a half percent, and people thought that was really high. We basically have ten-year Treasuries at three to three and a half percent. If the market really didn't have credibility in the Fed, interest rate, the long end would be a lot higher than it is. Recession has been the key buzzword here at the Qatar Economic Forum, and the CEO of the Qatar Investment Authority thinks that even if Europe enters one, he's still bullish on the region. Mansour bin Ibrahim Al Mahmoud spoke to my colleague Francis Lacroix. We could go into a recession in some part of the world. Maybe in Europe, I had uh, commented that uh, we might go into a recession in Europe because of the energy prices, the pressure. But also, I have a posit positive view on Europe in general in the long term. Uh, Europe uh, as a destination of uh, a lot of talent. Uh, they have a very good education system. Uh, it's a touristic uh, destination as well. And, and they have, on top of this, they have also an advanced program in the renewables, and this is, will give them an advantage over any other uh, you know, uh, countries. So uh, it might be a little bit difficult in Europe, but in the long run, uh, I'm bullish about it. So is, is Europe at the moment your biggest worry, but also your biggest opportunity? If you look at the pot of cash, how much you want to put in Europe compared to other regions in the world? See, from, uh, from 2018, once we have uh, announced our strategy, we, uh, we were very vocal about our concentration in Europe. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, we have said that we will not be stopping investing in Europe. We will be very selective. But we are going full speed in, in the U.S. market and Asia. Uh, you know, we have a, pro you know, a reference uh, asset allocation in terms of geographies, and we would like to, to, to reach a proper allocation between the geographies. Uh, but again, uh, Europe, we will, we will not stop investing. We will continue investing. We, I, have, I was in, in Europe recently, and I'm meeting, and uh, I have noticed a lot of activities in technology space in, the, in Europe. I, I think at some point you were looking for assets, uh, infrastructure assets in Africa. Is it still the case? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, if we can deploy more in Africa and infrastructure, it would be uh, fantastic. We have been investing in renewables as well in, uh, in Africa. And we would like to do more. Uh, it's, it's a little bit in a slower pace than other uh, uh, you know, uh, countries. But uh, we are trying to find our partner to deploy more in Africa. Anything with Russia? So you, you have a non, I mean, actually a, a pretty sizable and considerable assets yeah. in Russia. What will happen to them? Uh, still a status quo. We are not investing more in, in, in Russia. Uh, at the same time, to be practical, uh, you cannot exit. I know some, some companies have announced to, to exit it, but in, in, in reality, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. We are monitoring the situation in Russia. We are in full compliance with the international uh, sanction. We are uh, our team on top of this on a daily basis to make sure that they are embedding any, any update on the sanction. But we always wish and hope that this is, will be settled very soon for the sake of the people of, of Ukraine. Are you in touch with the Russian government about some of these assets? Not, not really right now. But, uh, but you know, we have a big, uh, a big investment in Rosneft. As you know, Rosneft itself is not under sanction. Uh, of course, we have a fiduciary to our future generation. Uh, of course, we will be in touch with them uh, for, for the dividends that we, we deserve. But uh, any further investment, no. What do you do with crypto right now? So it was, I mean, it's up, it's down, depends on stable coins or, or other ones. Are you interested as, am, as an asset class? No, uh, crypto, no. Uh, a blockchain, yes. Uh, uh, we have very clear view on this, and, uh, and our team in, in the technology space are exploring opportunities in the blockchain. And that's all from the Qatar Economic Forum right here in Doha. You can find complete coverage of the event, including full interviews and articles. The destination, Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg. In crypto, you have a world of young people that want their own financial system and their own culture. And it is very powerful, and I'm a big believer in it. A lot's happening on Wall Street. I think Jay Powell said things that were indefensible. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. We think that's the next secular shift. From business's most influential and instrumental. Yes, it's about renewables. It's a challenging dynamic. This is a level of uncertainty that we haven't had to deal with. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. covers the world like Bloomberg. Just a sense, get to 7% in the coming months. Mm. Do you see that coming true? There was something of a gray zone battle between Taiwan and China. Where are the job cuts to come from? We will not trust cut and run. With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks, 24 hours a day. Bloomberg, your global business authority. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. 
What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts. 它一定是作为原的啊啊，所以这个优先级呢，肯定是以钢体啊作为这个优。可以通过 Console Server 在 Server 客户端运行，或者通过 Console Server 在网络上分发，在网络浏览器上共享和运行。好的，接下来我们将时间交给陈博士，由陈博士为大家进行具体的讲解。嗯、呃，好，感谢主持人。那么，我想今天呢，就呃，花上一部分时间跟大家聊一聊这个呃，我们 Console 在呃结构里面怎么模拟去去模拟接触啊。那么今天的这个日程呢，主要分为呃以下几个方面啊。第一个就是大致介绍一下这个我们的接触问题，然后呢，我们就来呃和大家一起啊、呃、展示一下。这个接触对怎么去定义的？啊，接下来的话呢，我们会在这里面详细的为大家讲解，啊，接触在设置的时候怎么去设定它，啊，然后以及相关的求求解器配置，还有就是这个啊建模的一些建议。那么接下来呢，我会给大家展示一个案例。那么这个案例呢，啊，它涉及到接触设定的方方面面，包括一些粘附和玻璃的效应。呃，最后一部分呢，就是呃多物理场中的接触，这个涉及到一些其他的物理场，比如说电场和传热这些问题，如何在这个接触里面进行进行这个相关的设定。那么最后呢，就是我们的问答环节了。那么首先呢，我们来简单的介绍一下接触这个概念啊。那么 console 呢，在结结构接触里面呢，有很多方面的这个应用啊，它们并不是呃一个呃单一的非常简单的模型，而是有很多的应用背景的。那么比如说我们在这里面啊，有这个橡胶密封圈啊，这个案例呢，其实它经常用在这个呃车门的这个密封上面。我们都知道车门关闭的时候呢，为了防止水流和空气的这个流进流出啊，那么它需要有一个密封的环境。那么在这个里面呢，可以实现对这方面的这个模拟。还有像管道连接，管道连接的话呢，在这个里面我们可以模拟有预应力的螺栓情况下，呃连接的情况下呢，一个管道和一个板连接起来的这种受力的情况。啊，还有就是像右边的这个挤压管道，那么这个挤压管道呢，它也是有它的应用背景的。呃，我们经常说在这个啊、呃、海里钻井采采油，那么在这个里面呢，一般来说都是有这个石油管道通到海面上的。那么一旦发生了石油泄漏呢，对环境也是一个非常大的污染。那么这个时候呢，我们就需要有一个非常迅速的功能或者方式把这个油给截断。那么这个管道呢？呃，在这里面呢，就需要被挤压。那么在这个问题里面呢，就模拟了一个管道弹速性管道被挤压的这个过程，还有一些其他的问题，比如说像刹车盘啊，我们都知道汽车刹车的话有刹车片、刹车盘。那么这个时候，它们互相摩擦接触的时候啊，摩擦边界上呃是会产生一个非常高的温度的。那么这个时候，我们也可以去进行这个传热的问题的模拟。还有就是像我们的这个开关接触，这个开关接触呢，在很多电器呃零部件里面呢会经常用到啊。那么开关在接触的时候呢，会有电流还有热在这个开关接触表面啊流动。那么我们也可以模拟这方面的问题。当然了。这个流动，呃，电流的流动和呃热流，它们其实都是都是要受到这个结构接触的力学影响的。<咳>那么，呃，呃，零部件里面呢会经常用到啊。那么开关在接触的时候呢，会有电流还有热在这个开关接触表面啊流动。那么我们也可以模拟这方面的问题。当然了，这个流动，呃，电流的流动和呃热流，它们其实都是都是要受到这个结构接触的力学影响的。<咳>那么。呃，至于我们的接触的话呢，呃，在 Console 中呢，啊、呃，主要是像带有和不带有摩擦的这种接触。那么经常呢，我们都呃呃，主要是使用这个固体力学还有多体动力学来去做。嗯、呃，那么我们在接触里面呢，呃，因为是不同的物体之间形成的一种啊、呃、接触对的关系，所以呢，我们在这个里面就要指定它的圆还有目标面。另外呢，我们在定义摩擦的时候呢，也会经常用到这个。库仑摩擦，那么它分这个动态的和静态的啊，还有就是我们的这个粘附和玻璃粘粘附玻璃呢，呃，是比较新的一个功能了。那么，呃，这个粘附和玻璃呢，实际上指的就是在接触的表面，它们因为挤压
啊，然后产生一个粘连的效应。那么玻璃的话呢，又根据玻璃的一些呃这个判距来判定，呃，当受呃。啊，玻璃这种力的作用的时候呢，那么它们是否会发生这个啊、呃、互相离开、彼此本身粘连的这个表面？那么我们在接触里面最重要的就是这个算法了。那么算法呢，我们有啊增广拉格朗日法，还有这个法函数法。之后呢，会大会为大家详细的介绍。还有就是多立场的接触，多立场的接触呢，我们不仅有固体的固体力学里面的接触啊、呃，还有这个纯热里面的热接触，还有这个电流里面的这个啊、呃、电接触对啊。那么右边的这个图呢，就是我们的这个圆柱和一个砧板接触的这个表面的这个模拟啊，这个应力的分布。啊，右下图呢，就是一个圆一个目标，它们的这个几何相对位置的关系。那么好，呃，接下来呢，我们就来详细的介绍一下，在康斯洛中呢是如何去定义我们的这个接触对的。实际上，在康斯洛中呢，我们定义接触对有两种方式，一种呢就是手动创建，我直接在这个组件下面的定义里面，呃，直接右键选择这个对，然后选择接触对。那么我们在这个里面呢，可以看到，我们可以指定它的这个圆，还可以指定它的目标。当然了，指定的时候大家不要忘了把这个选择功能给激活。还有一种方式呢，就是手动创建了。手动创建的话呢。啊，自动创建，自动创建的话呢，就是需要我们在几何里面进行一些调整。啊，大家都注意到，几何的最序列的最后一个节点呢，一般是形成联合体或者形成装配体，对不对？那么我们在这里面呢，就需要把这个啊，默认的形成联合体改成形成装配。啊，之后呢，我们在这里面选择这个接触对。当然，在这里面，呃，有一个接触对，一个依据对。那么选择好接触对之后呢，呃，我们可以让它自动的创建对。啊，你也可以不勾选这个框。啊，之后呢，你你再进一步的去一个一个去添加。啊，你你所想要的这个接触对。那么在定义接触，大家不要忘了把这个选择功能给激活。还有一种方式呢，就是手动创建了。手动创建的话呢，啊，自动创建。自动创建的话呢，就是需要我们在几何里面进行一些调整。啊，大家都注意到，几何的最序列的最后一个节点呢，一般是形成联合体或者形成装配体，对不对？那么我们在这里面呢，就需要把这个啊，默认的形成联合体改成形成装配。啊，之后呢，我们在这里面选择这个接触对。当然，在这里面呃，有一个接触对，一个依据对。那么选择好接触对之后呢，呃，我们可以让它自动的创建对。啊，你也可以不勾选这个框。啊，之后呢，你你再进一步的去一个一个去添加。啊，你你所想要的这个接触对。那么在定义接触的时候呢，我们呃。有一个非常重要的啊、呃、操作，就是选择圆和目标，因为呃接触的话呢是两个彼此不能贯穿的物体，它们表面发生了一种作用力。那么在这个时候呢，必然有一个啊、呃、你需要指定啊、呃、一个目标和一个圆啊、呃、作为区分啊、呃、这两个接触物体。那么我们在这个里面呢，呃在指定圆和目标的时候，有没有什么呃依据或者说需要讲究的地方呢？当然肯定是有了。我们在这个里面呢，有一般来说呢是选择较大刚度的部件作为圆。呃，如果是刚体的话呢，那么它肯定就是圆了。另外呢就是。呃，弯曲半径比较小的这个部件呢，啊，我们一般选择它作为这个目标，比如说右图这个里面，下面这个圆体，呃，这个应该是个圆的表面，呃，应该是个圆柱。那么这个圆柱表面呢，啊、呃，它的这个曲率呢，要比下面这个平板的曲率要小一些。啊、我们都知道平板的曲率呢，啊、呃，它的这个弯曲半径呢，其实是无穷大的，对不对<咳>？所以呢，在这个里面呢，我们就需要指定这个目标是这个圆柱了。当然了，如果这个目标，这个是这个圆柱呢，它是一个刚体的话呢，那么它一定是作为圆的。啊，所以这个优先级呢，肯定是以刚体啊作为这个优先级的。另外呢，我们这个目标区的网格呢，一般来说是需要比较细的，特别是像这个这个圆柱体，它的表面的网格呢分布，一般来说呢，要比圆的这个网格密度要大很多啊。那么这个就是我们的一个推荐的标准啊，就是这个目标的这个单元呃特征尺度呢，要差不多要小于这个圆的单元特征长度的这个零点五啊，也就是圆的一半。好，那么呃，知道了如何去设定这个接触对之后呢，我们来看一下啊，在这个接触里面。它有哪些这个设定啊？它的配置是什么？属性是什么？诶，以及相关的其他的这个配合，比如说这个求解器的配置等等。那么首先呢，我们来介绍一下这里面比较重要的一个地方，就是选择什么样的这个计算方法。我们在这里面呢有两种方法，一个是增广拉格朗日法，还有一个是法函数法。那么二者是区别是什么呢？增广拉格朗日法呢，其实它模拟的是一个真实的、呃准确的这样一个接触压力。呃，那么它的这个收敛呢，呃，是趋于这个精确的精确值啊，就是实际上精确的值是多少？它是趋于这个精确解的。那么呃，我们的这个接触压力呢，要求有专门的这个求解的自由度，啊、呃，然后还有就是使用这个分离式求解器的啊，但是它有一些不足之处呢，啊，它首先说它的优点啊，它的优点呢主要就是在于呃收敛性比较啊、呃，这个收敛性比较好，呃，收敛的收敛的收敛性呢比较比较差一些啊，那么呃它的精度呢确实比较高啊，就是增广拉格朗日法呢，它的这个精度它的优势就是精度比较高啊，求解出来的接触压力比较准确，但是它就是这个稳定性。比较弱啊，相对了，相对而言，相对法函数来讲呢，啊，它更不容易收敛一些，而且它的这个法因子呢，呃，也会比较敏感，法因子的呃不能过大，也不能过小，这个时候对它的这个收敛性影响是非常大的啊，所以有时候呢，呃，我们也去，我们也需要考虑一个比较好、比较好的、比较合适的这个法因子啊。那么法函数法呢，它其实是一种虚拟的接触啊，也就是说，我们在增广呃增广拉格朗日法里面描描述真实的、准确的这个接触的时候，而法函数法呢，它实际上是相当于在接触表面之间呢设定了一个人工的这个弹簧，那么这个弹簧呢，用来去虚拟的模拟二者在接触表面上产生的这个压力。也就是说，通过这种弹簧来去取代二者之间真正的这种啊、呃、这种接触，那么这个地方呢就会带来一些问题啊，就是说它可能的接触压力的求解的精度会比较低
但是它不需要这个特殊的求解器，不像这个增高拉热法，它需要一个专门的特定式求解器。而发函数法呢，它不需要特定的求解器。呃，它的优点呢，就主要是收敛的更快、更稳定啊。那么另外一点需要呃提到的呢，就是在这个粘附合玻璃里面呢，必须要激活发函数法，你才能够去添加粘附合玻璃。好，那么已经在这个定义中定义好了我们的接触对之后呢，显然我们需要把它给应用到这个多体力学里面啊、呃，或者说多体动力学啊等等其他相关的这个物理场接口。那么我们这个时候呢，除了在定义中定义接触对之后，我们还需要在物理场接口里面，比如说固体力学里面，再额外再定义一个接触对的这样的一个边界条件。当然，其他的像电流接口、像传热接口也需要定义啊、呃、对应的这个啊、呃，比如说热接触对，还有这个电接触对等等。那么以这个固体力学里面的接触为例啊，我们在这里面呢可以看到啊、呃，它的这个接触的主节点的这个设置页面，首先呢啊，你需要去选择我们在定义中定义好的这样的一个接触对，之后呢。啊，选择我们的这个数值方法是这个接触压力，是增广拉格朗日，还是这个发函数啊？这是有下拉菜单的，可以去调整，可以去切换。啊，同时呢，我们在这里面还有这个发因子的控制。啊、发因子的控制呢，一般来说我们就可以使用这个默认的值啊，预置稳定性。那么下面这个触发和消减呢，对于这个求解的过程中呢，啊，可能会需要啊做一些这个调整，但是一般来说呢，这个也不需要做特殊的设置啊。呃，它的主要功能呢，就是放弃一些无望的迭代啊，不至于说你的迭代一直进行下去，但实际上这是一个死胡同啊，没有希望，没有可能去计算出任何收敛的解，但它依然还在浪费时间啊。那么另外呢，我们有时候需要去调整一些啊、呃、这个偏移，也就是说指定这个技术表面它对真实的情况有一个偏移，呃，这个情况呢一般来说用在一些装配体啊、呃、装配的零部件上面。比如说两个管子套在一起，那么它们之间有一个过硬配合，那我不能在几何里面把它们重叠起来啊、呃，而一般是说指定它们这个那，比如说两个管子的这个过硬配合装配在一起，那里面的这管子要比外面的这个管径呢，呃，里面。
跟管子的这个外半径呢要比外面的这个管子的内半径呢要稍稍大一点，这是实际情况。但在数值里面的话呢，我们呃因为无法做到这个呃呃这个几何直接的重叠的情况，所以我们要把它呃在这个接触面上让它指定一个偏移，从而创造这个过影配合的这个接触表面。那么最后呢，就是给一个猜测的这个接触压力值了。当然，这个这个装配在一起，那里面的这个管子要比外面的这个管径呢，呃，管子套在。那么另外呢，我们默认的值啊，预置稳定是这个接触压力是增广拉格朗日还是这个阀函数啊？这是有下了菜单的，可以去调整，可以去切换啊。同时呢，我们在这里面还有这个反因子的控制、啊。反因子的控制呢，一般来说我们就可以使用这个默认的值啊，预置稳定性。那么下面这个触发和消减呢，对于这个求解的过程中呢，啊，可能会需要啊做一些这个调整。但是一般来说呢，这个也不需要做特殊的设置啊。呃，它的主要功能呢，就是放弃一些无望的迭代啊，不至于说你的迭代一直进行下去，但实际上这是一个死胡同啊，没有希望，没有可能去计算出任何收敛的解，但它依然还在浪费时间啊。那么另外呢，我们有时候需要去调整一些啊这个偏移，也就是说指定这个基础表面它对真实情况有一个偏移啊。这个情况呢，一般来说用在一些装配体啊装配的零部件上面，比如说两个板子套在一起，那么它们之间有一个过盈配合，那我不能在几何里面把它们重叠起来啊，而一般是说指定它们这个那比如说两个管子的这个过盈配合装配在一起，那里面的这管子要比外面的这个管径呢？呃，里面管子的这个外半径呢，要比外面的这个管子的内半径呢要稍稍大一点，这是实际情况。但在数值里面的话呢，我们呃，因为无法做到这个呃呃这个几何直接的重叠的情况，所以我们要把它呃在这个接触面上让它指定一个偏移，从而创造这个过影配合的这个接触表面。那么最后呢，就是给一个猜测的这个接触压力值了。当然这个也可以是呃任意给定的啊，但主要是看我们自己的这个这个求解的这个情况了。那么接触压力值你可以让它呃采用一个默认的初始值啊，或者说像这里面你也可以给它一个指定的值啊，这个具体情况要具体分析。除了在这个接触对的这个主节点设置以外，我们还需要有可有可能还需要在这个接触的下面设置一些子节点，也就是它的一个子特征。那么这个子特征里面呢，我们怎么去调用它呢？啊，一般来说就是直接右键这个接触，然后选择里面的一些，比如说摩擦，或者说粘附，或者说一些其他的这个后备特征。那么在做这些摩擦有摩擦的接触之前呢，建议大家啊，先不要着急加加这个摩擦这个特征，你先计算一遍这个没有摩擦的情况啊。如果它收敛性很好啊，那么你再接下来再考虑加一些其他的这个子特征。那么我们在摩擦里面呢，呃，我们可以去添加这个摩擦的模型，比如说这个进库洛摩擦，还有这个指数型的动态摩擦。那我们在可呃在这里面呢可以看到进库洛摩擦呢，我们可以指定进摩擦系数，呃，抗滑阻力、最大牵引力等等。那么如果调整为这个指数型动态摩擦的话呢，我们可以在里面可以去输更多的参数，比如说这个动态库洛摩擦等等啊。那么切向方法的话呢，我们在这里面也依然可以进一步的调整，是使用这个增广拉格朗日法呢，还是法？啊啊，接下来的话呢，就是一些初始值的这些设定了。啊，右边的这个例子呢，就是我们经常见到的这个，也是一个比较经典的呃滑动蝎子的这样一个案例。啊、在这里面呢。呃，上下两个物块之间的表面呢，有一个相对的滑动。那么，你可以在这里面去看它的这个摩擦是怎么去设置的。那么我们在这个五点二 A 之后呢，添加了这样的一个接触的子特征，也就是粘附啊，或者说剥离。实际上粘附和剥离是在一起的啊，只不过是剥离呢是需要通过这个粘附啊，粘附的这个子节点里面去添加的。那我们这个和摩擦类似，我们也需要在这个接触对象面呢，右键添加这个粘附。那么粘附是什么意思呢？呃，实际上就是我们把两个物体接触到一起，互相挤压。那么有些情况下呢，当压力值或者说一些其他的条件满足的情况下。那么二者的表面会产生一些粘连的效应，还有一种情况呢，就是它们本身是粘在一起的。那么我们现在要把它给剥离，那么这个时候二者表面也会产生一些粘附效应的作用力。比如说我们这个右边的这个呃粘连区域的剥离的这个例子，那么它本身就是在呃两个板粘连在一起啊。那么我们通过这个没有粘连的这个自由端，把它往给它一个这个向上的这个剥离的这个作用力，那么我们可以看到这个粘附的区域呢，它是如何去呃从原来的粘连在一起变成剥离状态的。那么我们在这个里面呢。呃，首先呢，需要在这个接触对里面的主节点里面，把这个增广拉格朗日法呢改成阀函数法啊，这个是必须要做的啊，否则的话你是没法去找到接触对下面的这个粘附的这个节点的。那么之后呢，我们还可以在这里面去选择激活粘附的激活粘附的这个激活准则。那么这这个什么意思呢？就是说你给定它一个判距啊，让它知道压力达到什么情况下，它会激活激活这个粘附啊，或者说间隙小到什么程程程度的情况下呢，它也会激活这个粘附效应啊。当然你也可以去自自己去定义了，还可以去指定这个表两个表面，你不管。它是受力是什么样的情况啊，或者间隙是什么样的情况，它始终是粘在一起的啊，或者说始终有粘连的这个作用力在啊，所以在这个情况下呢，啊，我们可以在这里面去调整这个啊激活粘附的这个准则。呃，那么这个接触的子特征里面呢，呃，还有一个和粘连相反的这个过程，就是我们所谓的这个剥离。那么它同样是通过在这个粘附的这个子节点里面去设置的啊，有一栏就是你剥离的这一栏。那我们在这个剥离的这一栏里面，你可以看到，你可以。呃，引用不同的这个牵引分离的定律啊，有线性分离等等，还有很多其他的设置。那么在这里面呢，以以线性分离为例，那我们可以输入啊、呃、这个一些这个判距，比如说这个抗拉强度、剪切强度啊、拉伸能量释放率、剪切能量释放率。那么这些判距起了什么作用呢？就是当你把这两个物体表面本来粘连在一起，强制让它们分离的时候，它们首先受到一个粘连的力啊牵扯着它们，不让它们分离。但是呢，当这个力达到一定强度的时候，它必然要去啊、呃、这个裂隙必然会
。当然了，我们在这个生效准则里面也可以选择不同的这个模型，还有这个呃模式混合度的这个指数。所以呢，这个剥离过程呢，其实和这个粘连过程呢，其实正好是一个相反的过程。两个足够大的力呢，可以让两个本来粘连的这个边界给扯开，然后呢，可以对这个两层结构的这个剥离呢进行这个仿真和模拟。当然了，这个时候可能呃很多人会很关心啊，这个有些问题它是需要模拟这个裂裂痕扩展。那么在 COMSO 里面呢，我们能能够做的呢是已知这个裂纹啊，就是两个物体本身是粘连在一起的啊，它这个裂纹已是已知的。那这个时候呢，我们把它给揭开或者剥离，这是可以去做的。但是如果是本身这是一个实体，这是一个物质啊、呃，一个物块，那它里面没有任何的这个裂纹，只是说在外界的压力或者其他的条件下发生了一些破裂破损，而出现了这个裂纹的呃未未预知的这未预知的这个扩展的这种过程。那么目前呢，在 COMSO 里面是做起来是比较难的啊。另外呢，我们除了五点二 A 增加了这个粘附玻璃的这个新功能以外呢，我们在五点三的里面进一步的增加了啊、呃、和接触相关的这些啊、呃、新的功能啊、呃，比如说我们在这里面呢啊、呃、可以看到有一个新的案例，就是这个顺态滚动接触，这是一个呃 U 型的这个啊、呃、U 型的这个截面管，那么里面呢可能是一个胶皮管，那么这个胶皮管呢呃在这个 U 型的这个表面呢来回滚动，滚动过程中呢我们可以计算它的什么呢？可以计算它的这个存储能量变量，也就是计算它在这个过程中呢，因为摩擦耗损的这个能量。因为我们都知道摩擦本身啊、呃，它是一个非守恒力。那么这样的话呢，就会破坏原来的这个机械能守恒，从而让一部分的机械能转变为热能。那么加了这个接触能的这个功能以以后呢，我们就可以去计算，像这个胶皮管呢，在这里面，呃，它是无法维持一个机械能守恒的。它始终只要它在滚动摩擦，那么它始终会有一部分能量转化为这个热量消耗掉啊。我们可以看到这样的一个损耗。还有一个新功能呢，是我们在这个接触状态下呢，附近呢有一个线性化的这个频率分析。那么这个一般来说呢是有预应力的这种频域分析啊，所以预应力呢就是给它一个事先给定的一个啊拉伸或者压缩的这样一个应力分布，然后呢我们来来去分析这两个接触表面它的这个频域的这种特性。当然了，我们在这个求解器里面呢也有很多相关的这种设定啊。刚才我们说了，在增广拉格老师法里面呢，我们一般是使用的这个专门的这个分离式求解器啊。那么位移呢和接触压力它们是分开来去进行求解的。在这种情况下呢，我们一般不推荐使用这个全负荷求解器啊，可以说基本上就啊最好不要用这个全负荷求解器。另外一方面呢，是这个音变量的这个缩放。我们都知道，这个接触表面呢，特别是两个比较硬的物体在接触的时候，啊，那么这个变形是很小的。特别是比如说，我用一个钢球压一个玻璃的这个表面，那么钢球和玻璃之间的这种接触表面上的位移呢，非常非常小的。但是这个表面的这个应力呢，是非常非常大的。啊，这样就造成一个问题，就是我的应力的数量级呢，比这个位移的数量级呢要呃多很多。比如说位移可能只有毫米级的、微米级的，但是应力呢可能就十的九次方、十次方，甚至更多<咳>。那么这样一来呢，就会造成这个求解的时候。呃，求解的误差对这个数量级很小的这个呃音变量呢，影响是非常非常巨大的。那这样一来呢，就很容易造成不收敛。那么我们为了避免这样的一个巨大的差异呢，啊、呃，可能需要去调整一下这些音变量的这个呃这个数量级，让它们呢呃除以一个，比如说这样的一个缩放比例啊、呃，然后呢把这个过大的这个音变量，比如说接触压力这样的音变量，调到和这个位移的或者摩擦力啊等等其他的音变量差不多的这个同样的数量级上。这样的话，这样的话呢，求解起来啊、呃、精度会更高，收敛性也会更好一些。那么我们在这个接触的问题的时候。呃，给大家有一些这个建议啊，比如说我们用这个力控制问题，呃，在模拟接触的时候，大家都知道，呃，这个接触呢，呃，往往存在很强的这个不收敛的这种可能性啊，它的收敛性呢，不像其他的这个结构分析，它收敛性呃比较差，所以呢，我们在这个里面呢，嗯，对于这种接触，特别是非线性比较强的这种接触呢，呃，我们建议大家呢，可以先使用这个呃一个参数啊、呃，比如说在这个参数列表里面定一个参数，让这个参数对这个参数进行这个呃注扫描啊，那么。呃，让这个参数逐渐加载上去，那么这个参数呢，乘以它的加载力，或者乘以某一个指定位移啊，让这个你的这个边界条件逐渐达到你所指定的那个值，而不要一下把这个外界的这个边界载荷或者体载荷或者说指定位移一下子加上去、啊。这时候呢，一下加上去的话呢，它可能很可能面临了一些不收敛的情况<咳>。还有呢，就是这个充分约束这个结构，比如说呃，避免发生一些刚体的平移啊，或者说呃，你可以使用一些位移控制，比如说我们呃，用一个球体接触另外一个表面，那么这个球体在接触它的时候，我可以事先把这个球体指定一个这个呃弹簧基础。那么给它一个弹簧，让它把这个弹簧一开始的话加上去，之后呢，把这个弹簧逐渐的撤掉，然后把这个载荷逐渐加上去。所以呢，其实这个和第三个问题类似啊，在接触发生前的各部分在空间上是自由的，所以大家一定要注意，在接触发生前，你要考虑清楚哪些地方是欠约束的，或者存在因为欠约束造成的一个呃不太好收敛的这种情况。所以在这个时候可以增加一些人工的这个弹簧，帮助它去啊、呃、约束，或者说达到一个收敛的状态。那么对于这个大型的模型，特别是像三维的模型的话呢，啊我们。对这个接触压力和位移呢，一般来说是先选择这个线性函数、线性的性函数进行求解的啊，不要一上来选择这个高阶的这个性函数。那么另外呢，就是<咳>取这个消耗更更小内存的呃求解器来去进行这个加速求解。还有就是收敛问题，收敛的时候呢啊，对于这个大型的模型，特别是像三维的模型的话呢啊，我们对这个那么给它一个弹簧，让它把这个弹簧一开始的话加上去，之后呢把这个弹簧逐渐的撤掉，然后把这个载荷逐渐加上去。
所以呢，其实这个和第三个问题类似啊，在接触发生前的各部分在空间上是自由的，所以大家一定要注意，在接触发生前，你要考虑清楚哪些地方是欠约束的，或者存在因为欠约束造成的一个呃不太好收敛的这种情况，所以在这个时候可以增加一些人工的这个弹簧，帮助它去啊、呃、约束或者说达到一个收敛的状态。那么对于这个大型的模型，特别是像三维的模型的话呢，啊、呃，我们。对这个接受压力和位移呢，一般来说是先选择这个线性函数、线性的形函数进行求解的啊，不要一上来选择这个高阶的这个形函数。那么另外呢，就是<咳>取这个消耗更,更小内存的呃求解器来去进行这个加速求解。还有就是收敛问题，收敛的时候呢啊，大家可以去检查一下这个阀函数、这个参数、这个阀函数的这个阀数的这个参数呢，对于我们这个收敛影响往往是比较大的啊。还有就是一个部件呢，还一开始还没有接触时，这个初始的接触压力一般来说是比较重要的。那么你可以通过实验也好，或者通过一些参考数据也好，啊，你给它给它一个和这个真正的接触压力相匹配的，或者说相同数量级的这样一个接触压力，初始呃初始的接触压力，对于我们这个接触的收敛性，呃，有时候是起到至关重要的作用的。当然太高了太低了都有可能会产生一些其他的啊、呃、问题啊。那么接下来呢，我们花上一部分时间呢，啊，来给大家做一个这个案例演示。那么这个案例演示呢，其实呃也是在我们 console 里面是一个比较典型的一个这样的案例。那么它是呃由一个这个钢球啊往下挤压这个橡胶。当然，大家呃，如果有生活经验都知道，呃，如果橡胶和其他的一些物体接触的过密的话呢，它可能你再把它拿起来的话，有时候会产生一些粘连效应，对不对？那么这个过程呢，也会加在这个模型里面。那么我们首先可以看到，这个球的半径啊，五十毫米的这样一个钢球往下挤压，挤压这个周围一圈是固定的这个橡胶薄膜。那么往下挤压之后呢，再把它往上拉起来。那么最大的位移呢，是在这里面是八厘米啊，八十毫米。挤压到八十毫米之后呢，再往再把它往往上提起来。那么在把它往上提起来的过程中，呃，它呃这里面呢涉及到一些粘连。呃，粘连的这个玻璃效应。那么在它挤压过程中呢，事实上，当它挤压到一定程度的时候，呃，我们会有固定的呃专门的这个判距来去描述什么时候发生粘连，然后把它拽起来的时候，也会有相应的这个玻璃的这个判距描述它什么时候哪哪些地方可能会发生这个玻璃效应，还可以看到玻璃的过程。当然，一开始呢，这个两个物体之间是没有接触上的，一开始是有这个初始的一个五毫米的这个间隙。那么这个呢，就是我们呃待会儿模拟的时候需要用到的这些这个参数，包括一些几何尺寸啊、呃，包括这个橡胶的这样一个呃这个。呃，超弹性材料模型的这种参数，还有体积模量啊等等。啊、呃，另外呢，我们还有一些这个判距，比如说粘附，粘附方面有哪些这个呃什么情况下激活这样的一个粘附？这是通过粘合压力啊、呃、p stick 来去激活的。当二者表面压力超过了这个 p stick， 我们就认为这个表面粘贴上了。还有就是这个粘附拉伸强度啊，还有这个其他的像呃呃拉伸能量释放率啊，呃粘附剪切钢强度啊，剪切能量释放率等等。那么像这种呃剪切强度、拉伸强度、能量释放率这些呢，都是它的这个玻璃的这个判距。我们依据这个来去判断本来粘合上、粘合上的、粘合在一起的这个表面。啊，什么情况下会发生玻璃？啊，那么还有就是我们的这个球体的最大位移，这个球体参数呢，主要是用来控制啊它逐步往下运动的这样一个过程。那么我们来看一下这个粘附的设置，在这个里面呢，我们首先要把接触改成阀，之后呢，在这里面去添加粘附的这个子节点，在粘附的子节点里面，我们可以规定它的激活判判定准则，啊，达到这个压力它就被粘附上了，啊，之后呢还可以有这个玻璃的判距准则，啊，这个刚才呢也给大家介绍了。那么我们可以看一下，在这个过程中呢。呃，我们可以去呃分析它的这个结果中的这个应力分布，包括球体的，包括橡胶薄膜的，对不对？我们可以看最大位移处的这个应力分布，还有这个分析结束之后呢，就是它啊、呃、拽起来的时候，拽起来的时候呢，你可以看到它周围的这些啊、呃、本来粘附的区域啊、呃、发生了这个剥离。那么粘附剥离状态，这个这个的话呢，因为它是一个轴对称的模型，所以我们取一部分来去分析。那么我们在往下压的时候，那么你会发现这个绿的区域就表示粘连的区域，就是钢球和这个橡胶薄膜粘粘合在一起的这个区域。那么当达到最高点的时候呢，啊就是球体位移最大的时候呢，啊正要往上。啊、呃，撤回的时候，你可以看到这个里面呢，粘附的区域达到最大了啊。那么、呃、一旦往上拽起的这个球体的时候呢，你可以看到周围的一圈红色。那么粘附玻璃状态，这个这个的话呢，因为它是一个轴对，那么它的这个周围它的反作用力呢，需要定义一个这个组件偶，或者说映射，我们在这里面控制一下分布，分布啊，粘附，但是现在已经发生玻璃的分布，对不对？模型啊，对应的参数呢，也输入一下啊 ，C 幺，显然固定约束的话呢，啊，钢球的这个真实的。话是表面，就是应力啊。那么还记得球的粘附玻璃参数啊，打